Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 16th biennial Ralph H. and Ruth F. Gross Lecture. Thank you for attending. Those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you attending on Zoom. Before we proceed, on behalf of the University of Miami, I want to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Council of the Original Miccosukee Seminole Nation, Aboriginal peoples in the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida, who are the original owners and custodians of the land upon which we stand and learn. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lawrence Gardner. Dr. Gardner completed college at MIT, graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Medical School, completed his residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, and trained in nephrology at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital where he also served as chief medical resident. Dr. Gardner joined UM in 1974 and has served in several prestigious positions, including chairman of medicine and the executive dean of education and health policy. He also served as interim dean for the School of Medicine in 2016-17. Dr. Gardner was instrumental in accreditation of all postdoctoral training programs at Jackson Memorial Hospital created new training programs at JFK Hospital in Palm Beach, where they had never had allopathic training before, received approval for an emergency medical training program center for UM, Jackson, and Holy Cross Hospital in Fort Lauderdale, and was instrumental in advocating for the new medical education building. Of all of his achievements, probably the most impressive is that Dr. Gardner was the distinguished speaker for the 13th biennial gross lecture back in 2015, during which he delivered a speech on the Affordable Care Act, implications for the future of healthcare in the US, linked with education and medical knowledge. Dr. Gardner will now introduce today's distinguished lecture. Dr. Gardner. Thank you, Kim. A bit of hyperbole in her introduction, but we'll ignore that. It's my pleasure to be here. Welcome to everyone. We had hoped to have more of a live audience, but I think the weather conspired a bit and we're glad you're watching on Zoom. This is an interesting talk and a history about the endowment which supports this talk. The Ralph H. and Ruth F. Gross lecture occurs every other year in honor of the $1 million endowment that Ruth Gross made to the Miller School Lewis Calder Library to honor her late husband, Ralph. The Gross daughters, Mrs. Patricia Bergman and Mrs. Carol Clarkson and their family and friends are hopefully with us today virtually using the Zoom technology that we've come to know and love. It's our pleasure to honor their parents' memory with this ongoing lecture series. It's a unique opportunity to highlight exceptional speakers to address the value of health information and is at the heart of how this lecture series began. A little history. Ruth and Ralph Gross came to Broward County just prior to World War II and purchased a poultry farm. The first year was to say the least challenging. Only eight of the 100 chickens purchased to seed this farm survived. And Ralph determined to find out what happened began to visit the Calder Library and read about poultry and survival. He spent hours here. He learned from his research that nutrition and nutritional supplements were critical to improving the survival of chickens. And he ended up patenting uh, and marketing a nutritional supplement, which was very successful for his poultry farm and his eventual enterprise and I dare say resulted in the generosity of the $1 million gross gift. So we're incredibly grateful for the support and the dedication to the pursuit of knowledge it provides in real terms and real time. Our lecturer today is also committed to that pursuit and to making sure our faculty is equipped with the skills necessary to ensure our students and her faculty colleagues have the best learning and research education experience possible. Dr. Latha Chandran, 
joined the Miller School in June of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I might add. And as the Executive Dean for Education and Policy and the founding chair for a new department, the Department of Medical Education. Nationally, she serves as president of the Academic Pediatric Association and as treasurer of the National Board of Medical Examiners. She received her medical degree from the Trivantran Medical College in India and her MPH from Johns Hopkins University. Prior to joining the Miller School, Dr. Chandran spent 30 years at Stony Brook's University Renaissance School of Medicine, where she served in a variety of capacities, including chief resident. You'll note there's a common theme here about chief residents, probably the most important year I ever spent, frankly. Division chief, interim department chair, and several roles in the office of dean, most recently before her arrival here as vice dean for academic and faculty affairs, and the Miriam and David Donoho Distinguished Teaching Professor. Also, while at Stony Brook, Dr. Chandran was instrumental in major institutional change, including two successful LCME visits, establishment of an educational continuous quality insurance program, and initiating an entirely new curriculum, uh, which she encountered when she walked into the Miller School in 2020 as well. She served as the founding director of the Donahoe Academy of Clinical and Educational Scholars, a tenured educational scholar who has received numerous teaching awards at Stony Brook. She served as the founding co-director of a highly successful three-year national faculty development program focused on educational scholarship called the Educational Scholars Program for Junior Pediatric Educators. At the Miller School, her leadership in the new Department of Medical Education will not only advance the next-gen curriculum, but establish a core group of medical educators and researchers in medical education here at the school. It is with a great pleasure that I ask you to join me to welcome Dr. Shun. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gardner, for that very generous welcome. I am honored and humbled to be invited today to give this gross lecture. My topic is entitled Wellness in Medicine. Um, Kim told me that the, the family had an interest in nutrition. I am not a nutrition expert, so I thought about what is it that I can connect with the family's interest, and that's how we came up with this topic. I have some disclosures to make. I don't have any conflict of interest to disclose. I am not an expert on wellness or nutrition. I am, however, a general pediatrician with 30 years of clinical experience. I was born and raised in India and lead a mostly vegetarian diet. I do eat fish and eggs and all that. I do have a holistic and inclusive view of health as well as life. So what I'm going to talk about today is really my own personal reflections informed by some evidence from the literature. And it's really about how we maintain as an individual our health, not as a community, because as a community, we have to really be mindful of the social determinants of health, which are huge. And that's not the focus of this topic. So I have four objectives today for our talk. First one is to define wellness, and we all have different ideas of what that would be. And then what are some of the factors that contribute to wellness? I also wanted to mention a big factor in medicine because it's wellness in medicine, about burnout in medicine. That's something that affects a lot of my colleagues and my trainees. So we'll talk a little bit about that. What are some of the factors that contribute to this burnout? And then discuss about health in general, what are the different roles of diet and activities and exercise and so on. So that's where I'll spend most of my time in. And please feel free to interrupt me if there's anybody in the audience who has a question or a thought, that should be okay. So let's look at definition of wellness. So the National Wellness Institute, uh, whose uh, information I'll give you a little later, this is how they define wellness as an active process 
through which people become aware of and make choices towards a more successful existence. But I like the second one better. This is from the World Health Organization. And they define wellness as the optimal state of health of individuals and groups. And there are two focal concerns in wellness. One is the realization of the fullest potential of an individual. And that includes physically, psychologically, socially, spiritually, and economically, as well as the fulfillment of one's role expectations, whether it's in the family, in the community, the place of worship, workplace or other settings. That's a much more inclusive definition of wellness that I personally like. So that was my first objective. So this is from the National Wellness Institute, the first definition. They talk about these six dimensions of wellness. And I'm not gonna go through all six of them, but I will most of them. And the reason why I like this particular uh, diagram is because when you think about wellness, typically we think about physical wellness. And that's important, right? When you think about wellness, you may have the picture of a doctor that could help you in getting that wellness. And when you look at this whole picture, you can see that the doctor may be able to influence a little bit in maybe two of these domains, right? The physical domain and maybe the emotional domain, if it's a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a good primary care doctor. Uh, but the rest of the domains, a physician can't help. So the first point I wanted to make is that wellness and health should not be dependent on your, your doctor. So let's talk about physical wellness. We all know what physical wellness is, that we feel well, we feel healthy. And then again, the role of the individual versus the doctor. So one of the key points in my presentation today is that we have a lot of agency as individuals in our own health. And the doctor plays a part in it, but a small part in that. Um, and obviously when you are feeling healthy, you shouldn't be having any chronic disease. How can we prevent chronic disease? And most of the chronic disease we have is preventable. We always think about, you know, was I born to get this disease or did, um, you know, the nurture part of it come? How much of that is nature versus nurture in terms of contributing to health? I'm gonna take a minute here and ask people what they think of it. How many people think that nature is the primary reason behind our health, meaning our genes, how we were born? Show of hands. Nobody thinks that. So I guess everybody thinks nurture is the way to go. Okay. 50 50. 50 /50. I like that. Okay. Any other numbers? <laughs> 75 25. So you think 75 is nurture and 25 is nature. Okay. Yeah, you think so? Okay, we'll look into that. I have some evidence for that. So here is the evidence on that, right? Definitely our genes and our environment interact. We cannot choose our genes. Maybe there'll be a time in the near future that may change. CRISPR technology for which Nobel Prize was won can actually edit our genes and in the near future, we could have edited, gene edited babies. We don't know. I hope not, but that's possible, right? But right now we cannot edit our genes. We are born with our genes. And we, the environment interacts with those genes and results in our health. So when we talk about cancers, we all know that, you know, as we age, the risk of cancers is higher. But uh, from a study from 1994, 95% of the cancers can be explained by the environment interacting with the genes and 5% by genetic selection. That's profound, right? And that doesn't mean 95% is preventable, right? Some of the things in the environment we cannot prevent, but there's a lot of things out there that we can prevent. Looking at uh, monozygotic twins, which means their genes are identical, right? Um, again, you can see that 16% is what they attributed to genetic causes. And the other larger percent is due to environmental interactions with the genes, okay? So profound effects. So you are close to right um, of what that is. So the message is we have agency over our health. 
that's an important message. And if this message gets across early on, especially in the formative years, during your teenage years, those are the times early habits are set in, they can have very long successful lives. So our environment and our lifestyle choices can change or influence how the information coded in our genes is translated. And that's the field of epigenetics that has really expanded recently. And the epigenetics is the study of how your behaviors and environment influence changes the way the genes are represented, right? The genes have to make the proteins and how that can be controlled through epigenetics. And there are three mechanisms that they talk in epigenetics. And I have a slide to go over that. One is methylation of the DNA so that it becomes impossible for the DNA to, uh, to generate the protein or modification of the histone as well as creating non-coding RNA. So all of those mechanisms are ways by which this epigenetics influences expression of genes. So I didn't know who my audience was gonna be, whether this was medical or public. So I put in a few medical slides, not too many. So let me see if I can, uh... okay, you just see that there. So I'm gonna start with the left side here. These are some of the epigenetic mechanisms that affect our genes. This is the chromosome. In utero, there is, strong evidence that in utero toxic elements can actually influence your epigenetic expressions. Uh, environmental chemicals, the medications, pharmaceuticals that we use, aging itself, and diet has a huge role in how these mechanisms are expressed. So from within the chromosomes, we have this chromatin, and in the chromatin is the DNA. And in DNA, this is what I meant by DNA methylation, the, met the methyl group can be added to DNA, and that methylation can either activate your gene or suppress your gene, right? So that's one mechanism. And then these are the histone uh, modification that I was talking to you about. These are proteins that can be attached to the DNA and can change the way the DNA is so that the gene can make it DNA inaccessible, or it can also make it uh, active depending on how it goes. So here's another one, epigenetic factor, um, making, uh, added on to the histone tail and activating the DNA. So this is, these are the mechanisms by which our environmental factors can affect the expression of the gene. So even if we, have, we were born with that gene, we can modify that. And what are some of the health endpoints that they talk about? So this is the upper end. There is strong evidence that epigenetic factors influence the onset of cancer, autoimmune diseases, mental disorders, and diabetes, strong evidence. So that was about physical wellness. And I'm gonna talk about emotional wellness. I think it is very important. Emotional wellness, probably even better, more important than physical wellness. And that's feeling joyful when you come in, whether you're coming into work or going home, taking a walk, that sense of joy, which is different from not feeling sad, right? That's sort of a neutral state. But being joyful is a positive, uh, and people who have positive emotions are scientifically proven to have less number of colds, as an example, right? So how you think, how you feel affects your health. The other key message, so the first key message that I delivered is that we have agency over our health. The second key message I want to deliver is that the mind and body are one. And we think of, you know, sometimes when you tell a patient, it's all in your mind, it's like, oh, mental illness, you know, something versus your body is different. Mind and body are one. And more and more psychiatry and neurology are getting closer in their research because whatever thoughts are coming in our minds are caused by chemicals happening in our brain, right? So this is all one physical thing. However, we all know that in all societies, including ours, uh, mental illness has a lot of stigma around it. We don't want to say that we have a mental illness. We don't want anybody to know that we sought help for a mental illness. And that affects people's health. So I want to spend a little time on that. So mental health is a crisis in this country. And COVID just really tipped it off, right? So the American Association of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, as well as Children's Hospital. As a pediatrician, I have to say that. They just declared a national emergency in children's mental health in October uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this is what I'm not gonna read through that, but again, AAP precedent talks about, you know, how 
urgent this is to make um, some policy changes to treat mental health emergency as a true crisis. Now, even before the pandemic, we had significant problems. The rates of childhood mental health concerns and even suicide among children have been rising steadily at least for 10 years. And if you look at the youth between 10 and 24 years of age, second leading cause of death, taking their own lives. That's a terrible state. A bit more. How do we do in terms of prescription of antipsychotic medications? The data is staggering. When you look at data from 10 years ago, right? 1993 versus 2005, the number of people that we give has at least doubled number of children as well as adolescents and adults. We are going in the wrong direction with this, right? Again, the proportion of total visits and including a prescription for antipsychotics, right? Serious medications also doubled in adults. So what does that mean? A lot of people in this country are not emotionally well. And again, obviously genes play a part, but the environment also plays a part. So emotional wellness is far away for many people. Pediatric bipolar disorder increased 40 fold from 20,000 to 800,000 in that time period, 94 to 2003, right? This is from Columbia University. This is a serious problem. So we'll, we'll talk about how to handle that in a minute. So spiritual wellness, which is the third dimension we talked about. So we covered physical wellness, we covered emotional wellness. So spiritual wellness, this is also important. And I know this country is a spiritual country. Most people are spiritual, but some are not spiritual. They don't believe in God. And spirituality doesn't mean you have to believe in God. But having a sense of purpose and meaning in life, that's important because somebody told me that, again, from the Old Testament, correct me if I'm wrong, that without purpose, people perish, something like that. You know? And I think that's absolutely true because if there is no purpose, then you don't, you don't feel joy, the joy that we talked about. And therefore, connection to a higher power or a greater cause doesn't have to be a higher power, it could be a greater cause, it would be important. And thinking beyond oneself to the outer world, what can we do? And as we get older, that becomes easier to think about people outside of yourself and having some daily spiritual practices. So I do, I do practice spirituality, I, I do meditate, I do practice yoga. And um, I often, I put that guy through mantra. It's one of those 5,000, 6,000 year old mantras. And I say that looking at the rising sun because that is sort of an expression of how, um, you know, the energy in this universe manifests, right? So again, it doesn't have to be that. Whatever gives you that connection to that higher power. And also it's a humbling experience to see that there's so much more of wonder and awe in this world, in this universe. We're just a tiny part of that. So having some sort of a spiritual uh, practice, whatever aligned with whatever your spiritual beliefs are, would be very helpful in keeping you grounded. Uh, moving on to wellness in medicine, because that was the topic, right? So what has happened in the practice of medicine over time? Early on, the doctors used to go visit the patients in their homes. They knew where they lived, how they lived, helped them out. There was a, a therapeutic relationship between the doctor and the, and the patient. And that has over time, changed to where recently the doctor is just looking at a screen and talking to a patient. The relationship is very different, right? We have gotten busier and busier hospitals, rehab centers, long-term care facilities. Uh, it's become a more monotonous business. And that is one of the reasons why there is burnout among doctors. So the personal connection with those suffering and the joy when you take care of a patient and the patient gets better and the patient goes home and is happy, that is the joy of the practice in any health profession. And that is getting less and less now. In addition, there's one other thing that's happening, that's technology. When you look at the literature of physician burnout, the number one cause is depersonalization. They don't feel like they matter. They are a cog in the wheel. They just go on doing the things. They're trying to help others. If you are not yourself well and joyful, how can you be well and help others? EMR, 
electronic medical record, ever since the introduction of that, you can see the, the percent of physicians burnout has gone up considerably because they are going home. They don't have enough time to actually talk to the patient and write the notes. So they go home and spend their time that they have to spend with their family in writing notes. And therefore they hate the EMR, most of them. Okay. So how do we as healthcare providers achieve wellness? This is a very difficult thing. It's possible. And there have been conversations, I have seen some models where rather than us going in and starting to type in all these things, as you are having this conversation, and this technology is available today, that Siri or somebody like her behind the scenes can actually document that conversation and send you this note saying, doctor, this is what you said, is that right? So it makes it just easier. And you can spend that 15 minutes with the patient actually talking to them, looking at their eye, and, and discussing issues rather than looking at the computer. But that is not yet here. So here is the data on burnout. In 2020, 42% of the physicians reporting burnout, 20% feeling depressed, 1% have attempted suicide. One out of 100 doctors have tried to kill themselves after having gone through all that training. And 13% have thought of killing themselves. This is a huge problem. We talked about the top causes, bureaucratic tasks, hours of work, and computerization of the practice. And 300 physicians kill themselves every year. Pretty sad. So I put this slide up to show that technology is getting uh, faster and faster. There's a lot of artificial intelligence that's going on, deep learning machines. They are very helpful for us in the practice of medicine. But if you don't watch, you know, what is the man versus the machine? And we are going to definitely in the future have a symbiotic relationship between the man and the machine, no doubt about it. But how is that relationship going to nurture the human? It's something we have to be mindful of. People are talking about it, but we don't have definite answers yet. Again, back to the theme of health being our individual responsibility. So here I have a little uh, mnemonic that you can remember. Health, H-E-A-L-T-H. -E That's what I'm going to suggest. So the H stands for a healthy diet. We'll talk briefly about all of those, right? And that, remember I said mind and body are the same. So that's a body item, healthy diet is a body item. Exercise, that's the E, that's also a body item. The A is the attitude. Attitude is a mind item, right? L is for loving relationships. Again, a mind item. T is for time to sleep, which is a body item. And H is hobbies, which can be body or mind, but I put it under mind. So of the six items, Three are body, three are mind. Mind and the body working together for help. So what are some of the principles that I think based on my experiences um, are important for good health? It's a lifelong commitment to good habits, lifelong good habits that results in good health. And it's not a sprint. And that way, when I see people going on this crash diets and hot yoga and all that, it's not, if it's not sustained over time, it's not health. It's not a sprint, it's a very long marathon. Slow and steady is the way to go. And once again, the mind and body are one, both need sustenance. So a little bit about the mind-body connection. Uh, this is known for thousands of years uh, in the Chinese world, in Ayurveda, in India, Hippocrates, we all knew that the mind and the body were connected. And there were many integrated approaches in the East. More recently in the 16th to 17th century, uh, the West started to recognize this during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment eras. And really the fight or flight response was first discussed in the 1920s by Walter Cannon. And then later, Hans Selye talked about stress and the effects of that stress on health. We all know that. We all experience stress at some point in time. And you know, I hope we can have some Q&A time in the end to discuss some of these things. In, during World War II was when the effective the placebo effect was discovered, when people who were injured in the war, they didn't have enough morphine to go around to give everybody the pain medication. So this Dr. Beecher decided, why not try some normal saline? So salt water, injected salt water and the pain got better. 
So there was no medication in it, but the mind told them that they got some medication, it worked, right? So the mind-body medicine is now well-established, mind-body connection. And I'm not gonna read through this. There are a variety of mind-body techniques that each and every one of us can use to um, stay healthy. And there is a lot written about cognitive behavioral therapies for emotional balance and, and mental disorders. So um, mind-body interventions such as cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnosis, biofeedback works very well for pain, yoga, meditation. So these are the areas where there is actual strong evidence that mind-body techniques work. Heart disease, cancer, for pain, immunity, and wound healing. So back to our healthy diet. Um, somebody said Americans have an unhealthy obsession with healthful eating, right? So here we go. Um, Mediterranean diet is the most well-known diet that is uh, considered to be healthy. And the main points there are lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fish, and olive oil. That's the main diet that they use in the Mediterranean. And it's proven over and over again as the number one studied diet. Michael Pollan is a person who has written a great book. And his message, I think, is very, very clear, simple, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, one thing to remember when you are taking any food, the closer it is to nature, the closer it is to the source, the better it is. So things that do stay, have a long shelf life, that do not rot, are typically not good. Very simple to remember, right? Closer to the source, better. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about time-restricted diet. Uh, and you know, uh, diets come along, sometimes they say fat, don't take fat, sometimes they say don't take carbohydrates, do this, do that. It's complicated. We don't have to do any of those things. Uh, but I do want to talk about time-restricted diets uh, and fasting, uh, because there is evidence that this actually allows the body's natural healing processes. So um, that's something I want to spend a little bit of time. So, this is a colorful diet. Again, think of it as closer to uh, nature, mostly plants, lots of colors, plant-based diet. So when you have a restricted diet, you're stressed because you can't eat it, right? Denying something is always hard. So enjoying something is better. It's not joyful. And wellness must have joy built in it. So I would say moderation is the key. Eat what you like, eat moderately but always leave a small portion of your stomach empty, never overfill. That's something we all can do. Fat restriction has recently fallen out of favor because for a long time, we were all restricting fat, thinking that was the culprit. And what they recognize is that what we substituted instead was not filling. We were using many more sugars and simple carbohydrates and we were getting more and more obese because of that. Um, instead, use good fats, and that's what they use right now. So there is definitely a concept of good fats right now, uh, like avocado, non-tropical oils, olive oil, and so on. It's good fats. Time-restricted intermittent fasting. Uh, fasting is prevalent in many spiritual practices, and evidence in rodents. Uh, again, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and brain health. Fat, intermittent fasting protects them against all of those. In humans, this is the evidence, obesity, hypertension, asthma, and rheumatoid arthritis. All of those really do better if they are on a time-restricted diet. And what do I mean by a time-restricted diet? Um, fasting for 14, 16, or 18 hours, depending on how you want to do that, how you want to divide that time. So if you want to eat breakfast, maybe you can eat breakfast, lunch, and an early dinner, and then don't eat anything till the next day. That's a good mechanism. And how does it work? Uh, intermittent fasting actually modifies our neurochemistry, increases the resistance to stress, and oxidation is the main way by which we get all kinds of problems and reduces oxidative stress as well as inflammation, the other major cause of all these problems. So definite evidence for all of that. And it's really through the brain and through the endocrine system that these adaptive responses happen in many organs in the body. So for seizures in children, right, those who have intractable seizures, we tell them to go on a ketogenic diet, 
ketones that is produced during fasting or produced when you don't give any carbohydrates actually are very effective in preventing seizures in children. Uh, in many organisms, food deprivation results in pro-longevity. And what I found during reading this was most humans can survive a month without food. I don't know if you want to try that, but there's enough storage of glucose, uh, glucogen in glycogen in our liver. So that could do that and produce fatty acids and ketones. We can survive. I'm not suggesting that anybody do that, but you know, we don't need to eat as much as we think we need to eat. Now, here is another uh, diagram just to show you that the brain is the main um, agent in intermittent fasting, how it helps the body heal. And you can see that the that neural plasticity is enhanced by this and also stress resistance, as I spoke about earlier, and reducing oxidative stress and inflammation that happens in the brain. And um, again, reduction in insulin, IGF-1 happens. So it's a neuroendocrine sort of system that works, that affects how your gut works, how your fatty tissue works by causing enhanced uh, lipolysis of the fat and generation of ketone bodies, right? So uh, leptin comes down, the adiponectin increases and inflammation reduces. Likewise, uh, in the, uh, from the liver, gluconeogenesis increased uh, insulin sensitivity, glycogen breaks down and decreases IGF-1 levels. And in the muscle, increasing insulin sensitivity and reduced um, stress resistance. So fasting causes multiple organs to work to heal the body. It's very similar to what happens during sleep as well, which is another thing we want to talk about. So coming back to the same thing, the health, we're going to talk about exercise very briefly. High intensity exercise is what brief high intensity sessions is what works best. But again, for a lot of us, that's difficult to do. I don't want to do anything challenging, right? Quick activities that you can do and sustain over a longer time. If it's walking, that's fine. If it's swimming, that's fine. But do something that you can do every day if you can. Walk or swim or run or bike, whatever it is. You don't have to do high intensity, vigorous anything. Yoga, Tai Chi, Karate, etc. Nature is very therapeutic because it allows your mind to clear and it helps. So sunshine, woods. So I'm from Long Island. Uh, I was happy there when I came to Florida. I am sensing even a better state of being because of the sunlight, I think, because again, that has an effect on how we feel and being with greenery and all that, really feel that difference. A personal trainer, if you are not disciplined in terms of your exercise, that may be very helpful. They can help you, but you don't really need to spend money on that if you are disciplined and can do something. Attitude, the third one, attitude. This is extremely important. How we view things really affects how we feel about things, right? The story of the bricklayers I put in there just to, uh, you may have heard about this, right? Three people doing the same exact thing of putting bricks one after the other, building something. So two people go to the first bricklayer and say, what are you doing? And the bricklayer says, oh, every day I come in, I put one brick on top of the other, you know, nuisance job, I hate it. I walk over to the next bricklayer and says, what are you doing? He says, oh, this is the job that gives me money to go buy food for my family so I can go to the movies and have a good time. I'm building a wall. Go to the third person and the third person says, I am building a church, a place of worship, right? It's the same act, but the perspective of the three bricklayers are different. And the perspective really affects the experience of the person doing it. The third person is actually enjoying and having meaning in that work. The first person is suffering. It's the same work. Hmm? So perspective matters a lot. So uh, one of the things I do is practice gratitude every day. This doesn't cost any money, but it again is a humbling experience when you practice gratitude every day. We all have a lot of things to be grateful for. If we do that, it makes us grounded and makes us feel good. Um, here's another one. Let go of the need to know the unknown because that's where a lot of us struggle, right? We cannot control the outcomes of so many things, but we always wanna know what's gonna happen tomorrow. How do I do this? How do I do that? And to stress ourselves to disease. Just let go of that. Right? If you don't have control over it, why are we worrying about it? It's going to happen anyway. Live in the moment. Today is a day. 
live mindfully in the moment about all the things that we have. This I think is very important. Talked about loving relationships. That's a real need for every human being that we need to have you know, relationships and love. Everybody needs that love and attention. So again, unconditional love is hard, but if you practice that, it becomes easy. And this way you can nurture the body as well as the mind if you have that. Very important, that's the L piece. I wanted to talk about sleep because that is the T, time to sleep. This is very important. Again, doesn't cost any money, but very important. So this slide, the red are the men and the blue are the women and over two time periods, right? So this is from 1985 versus 2004. The percent of people who are reporting that they sleep less than six hours per day. You can see those numbers are going up for both men and women, right? In all age groups, in all age groups, you can see that. I mean, look at the young population between 30 and 64, a good 30% of them are saying that they're not getting six hours of sleep. Is it surprising that we are having all these chronic illnesses going on? Sleep is encoded in our genes. And there are two cycles of sleep, the rapid eye movement cycle or the REM sleep and the non-REM sleep. And each of them cycles about one and a half, two hours during our normal sleep. And during the non-REM cycle, there are again three stages. Non-REM three is the deepest, most restorative sleep. And every night when you sleep, you have to have at least one or two of those N3 sleeves to really for you to feel good when you get up. Um, so homeostatic sleep is something that we are all programmed to, which means at some point, if you stay awake, at some point you will fall asleep because that's how the body has been programmed. You will fall asleep. Um, there's also a circadian process, meaning a diurnal variation, right? So when you, if you're exposed to light, for example, you can't fall asleep. So, that, so these two pathways are really, and there's an endogenous pathway as well as part of that circadian process. These two are really very closely connected, the homostatic sleep and the circadian pathway. They work together. So, you know, when you are in the evening, typically that's a circadian rhythm. You start to feel groggy and start to feel asleep. So what do we do? We push it aside because we can, and we continue to watch that movie. I have done that, right? And continue to do whatever or play in our computer or a thing. And then what happens? That circle is gone and you can't fall asleep. So if you pay attention to that, then you can sleep better. And sleeping is important. So how much do we need to sleep? But we push it away and then we can't get our cycle back. Message, good sleepers survive longer. So what is good sleeper? That again varies. Not everybody needs the same amount of sleep, but this particular study talked about seven hours of sleep as ideal sleep. People who reported seven hours had the lowest mortality hazards of sleep. But if you slept for more than 10 hours, mortality went up, okay? So that's not good. So too little and too much is not good. About seven to eight hours of sleep are associated with longevity, longest lives. Other ones, right? Same, seven to eight hours of sleep associated with the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease, with obesity. Look at the upper thing about glucose tolerance and diabetes, seven to eight hours, significant. Significant, but if you sleep more than nine hours, see, that goes up again, right? Likewise, obesity, adjusted body mass index, lowest for people who sleep seven to eight hours. That's easy to do, right? Sleep well, the body will take care of itself. The last piece is hobbies, activities that give you joy, activities for the body and the mind, anything that you like to do, gardening, again, with nature, be good, anything that you like to do. Again, certain things actually help with co preventing cognitive decline. I do not know the science on that. I didn't get a chance to look that up, but learning a new language, learning a new skill, learning music, all that really have prevents cognitive decline. Medical education, people have taken, our accreditors have now taken this wellness very seriously because they recognize that even students are burning out in this environment. Um, so they really are, talking about both provider and patient-centered care, not just patient-centered care. The provider also must be taken care of. Um, and the focus has become more on treating illness in our medical education. We always talk about that in 
you know, how do we bring in prevention of illness into our training is something that we are thinking about, especially from a public health perspective, it's important to do that. So I have covered most of these areas, the area that I didn't cover, occupational and intellectual, but um, you know, I'm going to let that aside for now. So there is a lifestyle medicine group that is basically the same things we talked about. The one thing I didn't talk about is avoiding risky substances, uh, but all of the other stuff we, we talked about already. Again, health is our individual responsibility. I've given you healthy diet, exercise, attitude, loving relationships, sleep, and hobbies. Easy to remember. I hope you can remember some of this and practice that. Now, this being something from the library, I had to put a book in there. If you haven't heard about this book, it's worth your time reading this book. There are five places in the world that people have lived the longest and the healthiest. They are not frail. They are not in wheelchairs. They're walking around 100 years old, 106 years old, cognitively together. These are the places. Okinawa, you can read it, right? There's one place in the US that is on this list, Loma Linda. So what do they do there? Some of the things we talked about is what they do there, but please read the book. Um, again, no conflict of interest, Dan Buechner's book. So these were my objectives. I hope I covered all of them in the time period. So my conclusion here is health is an ideal state of existence. It depends mostly on the individual. It requires commitment to long-term habits. And I cannot again overstate the interplay between the mind and the body. Commit for the long term, live in the present, and joy of living a purposeful life can only be experienced. I thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. On the sleeping, do the, does the seven or eight hours have to be consecutive? Like if you sleep six hours at night, and then take a nap in the day. Is that count for seven uh, hours? I think so. It's okay to do I that. don't know the actual answer to that question, but I think so. Yeah, especially if the six hours is restful. Yeah. If you feel rested. That should be okay. okay. The total amount of our sleep time is what it is. That's important, I think. Thank you. Yeah. I'm concerned because I see the reality of some of the data you've shown relating to our, yep, our physicians today, especially the ones who have either joining our institutions or have been here for 10 or 15 years. The pressures to produce, the time constraints, and the challenges to find time to communicate with patients, I think all are combining to cause the sort of mental health symptoms and signs that you clearly identify. What can we, how can we address this going forward to see if we can take care of all of our colleagues and not make the work environment part of the problem or the main problem? That's a very challenging, but very important topic. I think if the provider is unwell and as we discussed, a lot of that is not even physically seen. It's all in their minds, the stress. If they're unwell, they will not be able to do a good job taking care of the patients. So I think we have to advocate for some wellness among them and you know, promote this concept that they need time off. They need to go home. They need to have their mind clear, just like our physical space has to be clean. Our mind has to be clean as well. So we need to advocate for that as leaders in the institution. Uh, slowly but surely. This is why for in medical education, we are, I think we are very mindful of that and we want to make sure that our students feel that they have some support and they have time to unwind. I have, I have a question on Zoom. Um, first of all, they said, bravo, this is an important talk that I hope contributes to the shift happens in medicine, integrative medicine, pardon me, currently a specialty but ultimately needs to be simply woven into medical education. I think it is critical we create physicians who hold this dear. Can you comment on how you see that happening here at UM? Yeah, so um, 
I was challenged by one of my colleagues at Stony Brook when I was sitting, listening to a lecture from a doctor, I can't remember her name, but she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and she was given a certain time period to, to live and she was not gonna take that for an answer. And, you know, she worked on this sort of integrative uh, medicine. She started walking a lot and all that. It was very inspiring to see a story. And then the person who was there, faculty member asked me this question about, what are you gonna do in the School of Medicine about it? And I have carried that thought with me since then that it is true that we spend a lot of time teaching about how to take care of the chronic illnesses when really, if we can teach populations to prevent those chronic illnesses, it would be better. And I want to do that. And um, you know, we have an um, integrative medicine center here and I've spoken with Dr. Karen Koffler here about how to integrate that into our curriculum. We need really the basic scientists you know, if there is somebody who has that expertise, I would love to talk to them because I think it's so important to have those ideas put into the little science minds that we have uh, among our students so that they will recognize that there are some schools that are doing that, community gardens and getting engaged that way in the community. Um, I haven't found that quite yet, but Dr. Koffer has given us some things to go with that. But I certainly intend to, if there are people that are listening and have that interest, I'm happy to engage that because I think it's very important to do that. I actually have another question on Zoom. What advice would you give an, ex an aspiring medical student with the pressures of school in getting achieved, getting accepted, and then later managing classwork with clinical, et cetera? How can we prevent burnout and what are some steps we can take to prevent this burnout early on? <laughs> I mean, the demands on life is so much that we will have this constant pressure. Medicine in particular is a very demanding profession, but it is to, at least what I do, I, again, I said, I don't, I'm not an expert, is to have that compartmentalization. This is work, that's not me, this is me. I need to be well, I need to. So being mindful, I think is the way to handle that. And then being mindful, everybody has 24 hours, seven days, right? That's all we have. So we have to be mindful how we spend that time and what we do physically and psychologically. That's what I would say. It's, it's not easy, but you have to be mindful. Otherwise it consumes you. And I have one further question in Zoom. What role do you see for lifestyle medicine in the future? I think lifestyle medicine hopefully will become a bigger and bigger part of the national conversation because it is not medications. It is not any of those things. It has to be prevention. And, and lifestyle is a way to prevent a lot of chronic diseases. Not all, but a lot. In the same patient treats comes, doctor treats patient cures. That's one of the clients we show is a responsibility, it's a your responsibility to maintain health. So, in my opinion, I'm not a physician, I'm a basic scientist. In my experience, I don't think during my follow up uh, visit to the doctor, no doctor tells you that they, they give you all to make an advice, medications, and follow up and all. But they don't that teach you to find the patients who talk and talk to you. Well, I think that's why I started my lecture by saying that the doctor is a very small component of our health. And we sometimes think that we are so important, but we are very small part. And the patient has to make those decisions, right? And the goal is not to become a patient, right? So only when you get sick, you go to the doctor. You don't really need a doctor to be healthy. 20, only 20% 20 at best. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, but patients have to choose. And one of the things that we are realizing is that um, if you don't go with what the patient wants, right, with the patient's belief system, sometimes the way we practice medicine was like, I know the right answer to your problem. I know I'm going to prescribe you X, right? Does that really align with that patient's belief systems and values? If it doesn't, you think the patient's going to follow through that and that? So that's where that, you know, 
really a partnership, a therapeutic relationship with the patient comes in where it has to align with whatever their belief systems and their practices are to effect change. Thank you very much for your engagement. You. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank we you present so this much. gift to you for being our distinguished lecturer this year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful.